Um, I'm a philosopher, and I'm happy to be here. And I should tell you why I say both of those things, because obviously the second is a throwaway. Who would come here and say he's unhappy to be here? Uh, it doesn't happen. I am particularly happy he to be here, though, at, in this room, working with you specifically, because I have long believed that those who are fighting the real battles in higher education in the trenches are the good folk who work in community colleges. My hat is off to you morning, noon, and night. You are working with the people who need it most. You have to teach too many classes, have too many committees, and you certainly are not paid well enough for your efforts. Okay. So, <laughs> 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 uh, in, in, my, in my spare time now, I'm a union organizer. <laughs> uh, um, no, I mean that very seriously. And, I'm not going to give you a lot of tips today on what to put in your syllabus, syllabi. I hope to be able to say enough interesting things that you'll be able to figure out yourself what to do. But I certainly want you to know anything I can do to help, I will certainly do so. I'll give you my card later on. You should all feel free to contact me. With, I'll give you my email address. Anything I can help you with at any time, I'm very happy to do that. To my first comment, I'm a philosopher. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not a scholar. But it does mean I make no claims whatsoever for objectivity, for impartiality, or anything like that. One of the few th useful things philosophers have left to do is challenge people. Challenge not only assumptions, but challenge presuppositions of those. So I'm certainly going to be a partisan today. And the particular themes I want to challenge you are some very, very deep-seated. For the first session, I should like to, my major background claim will be that anyone who seems to challenge the concept of human rights must be either a fascist of some kind, a Stalinist of some kind, or some other version of uniquely Asian authoritarian dictatorship. I want to suggest that that's altogether false. I want to give you a very different perspective on human rights, one that I think you can all resonate with, it is not uniquely Confucian, although that is where I shall be coming from with that. The second claim I hope to do afterwards, it's not in part of my title, but I've just finished giving a lectures on this topic at both the University of Iceland and Vilnius University in Lithuania. And then the title of those lectures were The U.S. and China, Who Threatens Who? Uh, there's a general the, 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 the disagreement in contemporary United States is whether China is an extremely grave threat militarily and diplomatically, and perhaps econ and, uh, uh, economically, or whether it's only a medium-sized threat uh, militarily or economically. Uh, I hope in the second session after our um, coffee break to suggest that Chinese militarily is not a threat at all, and a far greater threat to the security of the world is the United States military and diplomacy and not the Chinese. So therefore, what I shall be doing all morning is helping to let you look through the window uh, into the Chinese civilization in the hope that it will become more and more a mirror of our own. I hope to spend the time talking with you, not to you, or certainly not at you. But I am going to read the paper first a little bit so you can get the idea of the structure of the logic of the arguments. I'll cut some sections out to increase the opportunities we have for discussions. Uh, the title, I think, that uh, Linda Blanchett and um, Peter gave me was Human Role Ethics, A Vision of Human Rights in a Global Context, or The Discourse on Human Rights. And that sounds like it's going to be a talk in comparative ethics, and in part that is just what it is. But it's more nearly contrastive than comparative, and more importantly, I want to contrast not ethical theories, but one of the basic presuppositions on which virtually all Western ethical theories are based with a different presupposition, namely the one that undergirds the Confucian view of the good life for human beings and what makes for an optimally decent society. After sketching briefly the Western presupposition that I want to criticize, I will then go uh, contrast that with some basic views of the early Confucians and then go on to argue that the latter provides a more adequate and decent social and philosophical foundation for worldwide acceptance of all the rights enumerated in the United Nations Universal Declaration than do the Western views that currently dominate not only philosophical and political thinking, especially in the United States, 
but underlie much that is done by the legislative and judicial branches of our state and federal governments and many international agencies as well. These early Confucian views I will bring together constitute what I call role ethics. Roger Ames and I, next project is to do a book on that. But this too can be somewhat misleading, for as I will argue, the Confucian orientation is not so much a theory of ethics or anything else, as it is simply a way of life. Now for most of the past two plus centuries, in a process of evolution that stretches back to Greek and early Christian antiquity, the basic conception of what it is to be a human being in Western civilization has been individualism. That we are social creatures, strongly influenced by the others with whom we interact, has always been acknowledged on all sides, but has not been seen to be of the essence of our humanity. At the philosophical level, nor has it been seen as of great worth. The reason for this is that our social situations are in an important sense accidental, in that we are exercise no control over most of them, i.e. who our parents are, the native languages we acquire, our citizenship, and so forth. As a consequence, what gives human beings their primary worth, their dignity, integrity, and value on this account, and what must command the respect of everyone, is their ability to act purposively, to have a capacity for self-governance, i.e. to be autonomous. Now this skeletal view of human beings can be fleshed out by considering what other qualities must also inhere in them for the concept of the autonomous individual to become a robust and not a barren concept. Individuals must be rational if they are to be autonomous. That is to say, they must be, they must be capable of exercising uh, going uh, uh, rational faculties against instinct, against emotion or conditioning for creatures that cannot so act are surely not autonomous. Further, human beings must have freedom as another defining characteristics of who they are. If they were not free to rationally choose between alternative courses of action and then act on the choices made, how could they be said to be autonomous? We see these linked qualities clearly when we ask, why did you do that, as a moral question. Clearly it assumes the individual was free to have done otherwise, and that he or she can give reasons for their choice, i.e. they behaved rationally. Uh, in addition, although the quality of being self-interested is not strictly entailed by this basic view of human beings, it has been standard in most of philosophy, and even more of political theory, and of course all of economics since before the Enlightenment and the rise of industrial capitalism in the West. Further, these qualities of individual human beings as most fundamentally autonomous, rational, and free have been taken as unalloyed goods in the ethical sense. Some have been more skeptical about self-interest. For example, the major stumbling block for opponents of Roe v. Wade and their struggles to have it overturned is that doing so would clearly restrict the freedom of women to rationally choose the course of action they wanted to follow with respect to their pregnancy. While abortions are never anything to celebrate, restricting human freedom to choose rationally what to do, especially with respect to one's own body, is always prima facie very wrong because individuals have an inalienable right, as Jefferson put it, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, if we define human beings in this individualistic manner, it would seem to follow that in thinking about how we ought to deal morally with our fellows, we should seek as abstract and general a viewpoint as possible. If everyone has the highly valued qualities associated with individualism, and it is just these qualities we must respect at all times, then their gender, age, ethnic background, religion, skin color, and so on, should play no significant role in our decisions about how to interact with them morally. <clears throat> Thus, on this orientation, it is incumbent upon us to seek universal principles and values applicable to all peoples at all times, or else the hope of a world at peace, devoid of group conflicts, racism, sexism, homophobia, and ethnocentrism could never be realized. 
Moreover, the best way to do this is obviously to strive to ignore and transcend our own spatio-temporal location and cultural tradition. To overcome, that is, our personal prejudices, hopes, fears, likes, and dislikes, and on the basis of reason alone, ascertain beliefs and principles that should be compelling to all other rational persons, equally ignoring and transcending their specific locations, backgrounds, and biases. Our differing heritages, personalities, sexual orientation, perspectives, and much more divide us on this individualistic account and are a major source of conflict. But all normal human beings have a capacity to reason, which thus unites us all and consequently offers a greater hope for a less violent human future than has been the case in the past and at present. This emphasis on the use of reason, on objectivity, impartiality, and abstraction has provided strong support for arguments in favor of universalism in ethics. Many people, and almost all Western philosophers, have been persuaded by it, not unreasonably. This is a strong argument, complete with a vision of peace, freedom, and equality, which makes the rare challenges to this position seem either hopelessly relativistic, authoritarian, or both authoritarian and relativistic. Uh, now, I have some, I want to talk a little bit about ethical theories, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to skip those Kant and Mill for now, but I'll come back to them if you like. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to go on now. To, that is, if you will, quickly the best shot I can give to individualism in brief compass. And now I want to go on to say that as useful as it was for a long time, it's now more of a liability than an asset to securing social justice in the world and with respect to human rights. It's just a wrong foundation. The alternative I want to offer is that of classical Confucianism. The views I want to consider were set down in four texts written and edited roughly between the fifth and the second centuries before the Common Era. The Analects of Confucius, the Mencius, the Shunzi, and the Records of Ritual, or the Ji. These four works are by no means in full agreement on all counts and there are several tensions within each work itself. Nevertheless, in conjunction with a few other texts that achieved canonical status, the Book of Changes, Poetry, and History, these texts do present an overall coherent view of the good society and the good life for human beings therein. This good life is an altogether social one, and central to understanding and appreciating it is to see that Confucian sociality has aesthetic, political and spiritual, no less than moral dimensions, all of which we must learn to integrate if we are to lead worthy lives, and that is the spiritual discipline of Confucianism. It must be emphasized at the outset that the Confucian good life is not so much a goal of our lives, something to be achieved and then maintained, as it is a way of human life, the Ren Dao. It is how and why like Thoreau to a significant extent, we endeavor to lead our lives deliberately and well. In the same way, none of the early texts address the question of the meaning of life, but they do put forward a vision and a discipline in which everyone can find meaning in life. This meaning will become increasingly clear as we pursue the full realization of our humanity, namely developing ourselves most fully as human beings to become junza, exemplary persons, or at the pinnacle of development, shangren, or sages. And for Confucians, we can only do this through our interactions with other human beings. Treading this human path, this ren dao, must be ultimately understood as most fundamentally a religious journey, even though the canon speaks not of God, nor of creation, salvation, an immortal soul, or a transcendental realm of being, and no prophecies will be found in its pages either. It is nevertheless a truly religious path, I would argue, followed in concert with others. As Confucius remarked, I cannot run with the birds and beasts. Am I not one among the people of this world? If not them, with whom can I associate?" Unquote. Now, by emphasizing our sociality, the Confucians simultaneously emphasize our relationality. An abstract individual, I am not, but rather am I a son, 
a father, a grandfather. I'm a teacher, a student, colleague, neighbor, friend, citizen, and more. In all of these roles, I am defined in large measure by the others with whom I interact. Highly specific personages related to me in one close way or another. They are not abstract, autonomous, free individuals. I live rather than play these roles. And when all of them have been specified and their interrelationships made manifest, I have been fairly thoroughly individuated, but with nothing left over with pitched to piece together an autonomous individual self. Being thus the aggregate sum of the roles I live, it must follow that as my roles change, so do I. Marriage made me a different person, as did becoming a father and later a grandfather. You all know that. My students don't all know it right away, <laughs> how we are changed in these ways. Divorce or becoming a widower would change me yet again. While my role as student never disappears, it was overshadowed after my formal studies were completed as I became a professor. Former students become young friends. Young friends become old friends, all of which have a significant effect on who I am and how I'm to be defined. All the more so is this true when old and cherished friends and relatives die, making me yet again a different person. Moreover, a moment's reflection on our interpersonal behavior from this perspective should suggest that seeking an essential self, something that remains constant and unchanging throughout the vicissitudes of our lives, might be like chasing a will-o'-the-wisp, the so-called constancy of memory notwithstanding. For, I would claim, for the sake of argument, if nothing else, we are basically constituted by the roles we live in the midst of others. Does not our tone of voice change when speaking to our parents than to a friend? Is our demeanor the same with a lover as with a younger sibling? Is the visage we present to neighbors the same we present to strangers? For virtually all of us, I believe, the answer to these and similar questions is no. And if so, then in an important sense, we might come to understand that who we, quote, really are, unquote, is significantly a function of who we are with, when, and under what specific circumstances. It follows from this perspective that we are all consistently changing, our sense of continuity through memory notwithstanding, and therefore any goal of human perfectibility can never be fully realized. The rendau of the early Confucians is not so much achieved, as I suggested earlier, uh, as led. As Confucius put it succinctly in the Analects, quote, people can broaden the way, the Tao. The Tao cannot broaden people, unquote. Moreover, we must strive to broaden the way with diligence throughout our lives. Now, although this early Confucian view of the human being is very different from the abstract autonomous individual I sketched earlier, rational, free, and probably self-interested, <coughs> It is, I hope, not seen as altogether remote from ourselves. The Confucian view is, I believe, a rather straightforward account of our actual lives in the United States, no less than in ancient China. In order to be a friend, a neighbor, or a lover, for example, I must have a friend, a neighbor, or a lover. <laughs> Other persons are not merely accidental or contingent to my goal of following the path of being as fully human as possible. They are essential to it. Indeed, they confer personhood on me, and they do so continuously. To the extent I live the role of a teacher, students are absolutely necessary to my life, not incidental to it. It must also be noted in this regard that, again, while Confucianism should be seen as fundamentally religious, there are no solitary monks, no nuns, no anchorites, anchoresses, or hermits in the Confucian tradition. The way is made in the walking of it, but one never walks alone. Our first and most fundamental role that defines us in significant measure throughout our lives is as children. Xiao, 
which I translate as family reverence, is one of the highest excellences of integrated thought and feeling to be nurtured in Confucianism. We owe unswerving loyalty to our parents and our manifold obligations to them do not cease at their death. From our initial role as sons and daughters and as siblings, playmates, and pupils, we mature to become parents ourselves and become as well spouses or lovers, neighbors, workmates, colleagues, friends. All of these are reciprocal relationships, translating with Chinese shu, best described as holding between benefactors and beneficiaries, not superiors and inferiors, as too many missionary translators have been wont to do in the past. The roles are thus clearly hierarchical, but they are not elitist. Each of us moves from benefactor to beneficiary and back again, depending on the others with whom we are interacting, when and under what conditions. When young, I was largely beneficiary of my parents. When they became old and infirm, I became benefactor. The same holds with my children. I am benefactor of my friend when she needs my help, beneficiary when I need hers. Taken together, the manifold roles we live define us as unique persons, undergoing changes throughout our lives and the ways we instantiate these relations is the means whereby we achieve dignity, satisfaction, and meaning in life. The ideal Confucian society is thus basically family and communally oriented, with customs, traditions, and rituals serving as the binding force of and between our many relationships and the obligations attended on them. To understand this point fully, we must construe the term li, translated as ritual propriety, not simply as referring to weddings, bar mitzvahs, ramadans, holidays, and funerals, but equally as referring to the simple customs and courtesies given and received in greetings, sharing food, caring for the sick, leave takings, and much more. To be fully social, Confucians must at all times be polite and manly in their interactions with others. And these interactions should be performed with both grace and joy. We are all taught to say thank you, a small ritual, when we receive a gift or a kindness from someone. From the Confucian perspective, however, to say thank you is also to give a gift, signaling a small kindness that they have made to the other, that they have made a difference, however slight, in your life. This then, in brief compass, is the Confucian persuasion in action. Relating to and with others as benefactors and beneficiaries in an intergenerational context, and deriving increasingly deep satisfaction from so doing. Confucius himself was absolutely clear on this point, for when a disciple asked him what he would like most to do, he said, and here I hope you all take this as religious instruction, quote, I would like to bring peace and contentment to the aged, share relationships of trust and respect with friends, love and protect the young." Unquote. Now, for all these reasons, I believe Confucianism, at least early Confucianism, is best described as a role ethics, even though it is not, strictly speaking, an ethical theory. It is unique in this regard. In the first place, it does not employ or seek universal principles, because what we should do depends on who we are doing it with and when. Confucianism is highly particularistic in that we are always to do what is ye appropriate in a given situation. And what might well be appropriate for me to do with my grandmother may differ significantly from what I would do if it was my younger brother in that situation, as we have already noted. And it may differ from what it might be appropriate for you to do with your grandmother, whose personality may well differ from mine. Confucian particularism is normally seen in Western moral and political philosophy as decidedly inferior to universalism. Immanuel Kant, for example, said Confucius knew nothing of morality and no Chinese had a moral bond in their body. But we may nevertheless make generalizations from the canon that are no less important today than 2,000 years ago. When interacting with the elderly, be reverent, caring, obedient. When dealing with peers, don't treat them as you would dislike being treated. With the young, be nurturing, careful, loving, exemplary. 
Of course we did not learn these generalizations as moral principles when we were young, but it is on the basis of many and varied loving interactions with my own grandmothers that I learned long ago to develop an approximate sense of how to interact appropriately with other grandmothers. Now compared to most issues in contemporary Western moral philosophy, abortion, suicide, euthanasia, intellectual property rights, genetic engineering, and so forth, the importance of making birthday cards for our grandmother must seem incredibly trivial, not even deserving of consideration as a moral issue. But as the early Confucian canon reveals with surety, these homely little activities are the basic stuff of our human interactions and our human lives. And Confucius is telling us that if we learn to get the little things right on a day in and day out basis, the so-called big things will begin to take care of themselves. And in addition to grandmothers and other elders, the little things involve our close interaction with our peers and those younger than ourselves. And in this way, begin to bring home to each of us our common humanity, as we know we will go through all these stages of life ourselves. I can only begin to fully actualize my moral and spiritual potential when I have learned from my interaction with my own grandmother that although each grandmother is surely unique, they share qualities, live roles, and interact with others, such that in one sense, when you learn to fully appreciate your own grandmother, you've come a long way toward appreciating fully all grandmothers, despite differences in skin color, ethnicity, religion, or other characteristics, or whether they are Iraqi or Afghani or anything else like that. We cannot, however, simply go through the motions of following custom, tradition, and ritual interactions, <laughs> nor should we fulfill our obligations, mainly because we have been made to feel obliged to fulfill them, or else we could not continue to develop our humanity. Rather, must we make them our own and modify them or append them as needed. Remember that for Confucius, many of our obligations are not, cannot be freely chosen. There is no word for freedom in the classical language in which the Confucians wrote their materials. But if I could give the shade of Confucius a sense of what it was, I believe he would insist that freedom is an achievement term, not a state of one. We could only become to begin to become truly fear when we want to fulfill our obligations, when we want to help others as benefactors, and can enjoy being helped by others as beneficiaries. Being thus altogether bound to and with others, it must follow that the more I contribute to their flourishing, the more I too flourish. Conversely, the more my behaviors diminish others by being racist, sexist, nationalistic, homophobic, the more I am diminished myself thereby. To be sure, Chinese society was highly patriarchal throughout much of its history, and the history of Chinese women consequently at least as bleak as that of their European sisters. At the same time, and again like Europe, China had no shortage of despotic monarchs, toadying officials, abusive parents, and tall peasants. But it is important to note that these kinds of people are thoroughly condemned in the classical texts with very, very little justification for such sorry behaviors. How and why they came to dominate so much of imperial Chinese social life, despite what is actually found in the Analects and the other Confucian writings, has not received the attention from scholars Western or Chinese that it surely should. Put another way, my claim here is that the vision of classical Confucianism can be retained today with its integrity basically intact while yet condemning and struggling against sexism, racism, homophobia, subservience, and elitism of any kind. In saying that I can only flourish as I contribute to the flourishing of others and am diminished when I diminish others, I hope I have made clear that I'm not proffering here a Confucian view of selfless or altruistic behavior, but that would imply that I have a free, autonomous self to surrender. But this, of course, would beg the question against the Confucians at the outset, whose views clearly show the supposed dichotomy between selfishness and altruism as a Western conceit, as well as the equally Manichaean split on which it is based, the individual versus the collective. 
this time my way of thinking to do away with both of those distinctions because they now are a distinct hindrance to thinking anew about how to face the problems of the 21st century that Peter was so admirably laying out in general for you last night. Overcoming these deeply rooted dichotomies in Western thought is not at all easy, but once the ingrained abstract image of the free, rational, self-interested, autonomous individual begins to blur, very different possibilities for envisioning the human condition and the good society can present themselves if we are willing to look for them. I submit that these early Confucian ways of seeing ourselves as most basically co-members of families, of groups, of communities, and of the human race can easily lead to a conception of human rights far more robust and substantial than that which currently dominates our moral, political, and legal thinking, especially in the United States. If what binds us together is felt more strongly than that which separates or individuates us, we can come to appreciate that every person has dignity and insist on a more equitable distribution of material goods and opportunities sufficient for each person to not simply achieve and maintain dignity and flourish, but also to be able to contribute to the flourishing of others. To suggest how this might be accomplished, I want to turn our attention now directly to the concept of human rights. If one of the defining characteristics of the autonomous individual is freedom, then it would seem to follow that no one, and especially no government, should curtail my freedom to engage in very basic human activities, such as saying whatever I believe should be said, associate with whomever I wish, accept any set of religious beliefs I hold true, and dispose of any land or material goods I have legally acquired, however I see fit. In the United States, these are the most basic of freedoms, and it is this claimed I have an inalienable right to them. To flourish, I must be secure in the enjoyment of these rights or freedoms, entering only the caveat that I do not infringe these rights on others. For Americans, these rights, these freedoms, are protected by the Bill of Rights. They are civil and political in nature and are now most commonly referred to as first-generation rights. And of course, much of the plausibility of seeing these civil and political rights as the most basic stems from the concomitant view of seeing human beings as basically autonomous, free, rational individuals. During the course of the 20th century in the United States, these basic rights have been extended beyond the human realm to corporations. These, too, are seen to be free, autonomous, supposedly rational, and certainly self-interested, profit-maximizing entities that must be secure in the enjoyment of these rights no less than individuals if they are to prosper and bring prosperity to the nation. Well, at least that is what is claimed. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, however, goes far beyond civil and political rights. It declares, specifically in Articles 22 through 27, that human beings have fundamental economic, social, and cultural rights, or second-generation rights. Civil and political rights are often described as negative following Isaiah Berlin, which can be misleading. But they are surely passive in that they are invoked to guarantee freedom from coercion. Second generation rights, on the other hand, are active, intended to obviate social and natural impediments to the full realization of our human potential. The right to an education, a job, health care, decent housing, and so on. Without these rights, the UN Declaration claims, concept of human freedom and autonomy are altogether hollow. Freedom from and freedom to are clearly distinct, and freedom from can loom large in our political thinking if our only concern is on the threat of authoritarian governments or the supposed tyranny of the majority in the political realm. But if we combine moral and political considerations and ask what it means for each of us as persons, not governments, to respect the rights of others, things begin to look rather different. That first-generation rights are indeed fundamentally passive can be seen from the fact that 99.9% .9 of the time I can fully respect all of your civil and political rights simply by ignoring you. <laughs> you have a right to speak, no right to have me listen. <laughs> Second-generation rights, on the other hand, are active. They are active in the sense that there are things I must do, pay more taxes at the very least, if you are to secure them. 
Put another way, schools, medicines, jobs, food security, affordable housing, hospitals, and so on, do not fall from the sky. They are human creations. And herein lies a fundamental contradiction in all contemporary discourse on human rights grounded in the concept of the autonomous individual in the West. To whatever extent I am obliged to assist in the creation of those goods which accrue to you by virtue of your having second generation rights, to just that extent I cannot be an altogether autonomous individual enjoying first generation rights, free to rationally decide upon and pursue my own projects rather than helping you with yours. That I too can have the second generation rights to these goods is of no consequence if I believe like all libertarian, most conservative, and even a few liberal theorists, and of course all millionaires, <laughs> that I can secure them on my own or in free contractual association with a few others. It would be equally irrelevant for Confucius that I can freely choose to assist you in securing those goods necessary for the positive exercise of your freedom on my own initiative. For that would be an act of charity, not an acknowledgment of your rights to them. Uh, <clears throat> now, note that while the number of philanthropists among the super rich is increasing somewhat, they decide how and where their monies will be spent. To the best of my knowledge, none of them suggest paying more taxes to enable a democratically elected government to distribute goods as needed. Arguments for second generation rights have a special force in developing nations but apply as well to the highly developed United States, I believe. Of what value is the right of free speech if, unschooled, it is difficult for me to clearly articulate my agonies, or I am too sick to say anything at all without any access to a hospital? How much freedom of speech does a single mother with two small children working for minimum wage in the South Bronx have compared to the CEO of Mobile Exxon? To be sure, I have the same right to take out a full-page ad in the New York Times as Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, or Murdoch. There's only one little difference between us. They pay for their ads out of pay petty cash. I have to sell my house to pay for mine. What good is the right to freely dispose of what I own if I don't own anything? What good is the right to freely choose a job if there aren't any jobs that provide a living wage for my family? Now, if my analysis of this inherent contradiction between first and second generation rights claims is correct, it follows that rights-bearing autonomous individuals will not be able to provide adequate answers to these and similar questions in the future any more than they better than they have done in the past. Confucian role-bearing related persons, however, may be able to dissolve the contradiction and hence resolve the problems raised by these questions. To appreciate the importance of attempting the effort, let me examine now some painful dimensions of the world today, especially with respect to the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots, which I believe Peter alluded to at least briefly last night. In a world of even a roughly equitable distribution of wealth and property, protecting civil and political rights would obviously be of great importance. Unfortunately, the real world is rather different. Considering the following from a recent Wall Street Journal article, certainly no left-wing publication, quote, 40 years ago, the world's 20 richest country had a per capita GDP 18 times greater than that in the world's 20 poorest countries. The most recent statistics indicate the rich country's GDP is now 47 times higher. Over 1.2 billion people around the world live on less than $1 a day. I think Peter mentioned last night that you can use your credit card absolutely anywhere in the world. Isn't that amazing for globalization? But we also have to keep in mind that over 5 billion people don't have any credit cards. On the other hand, according to Forbes magazine, there are now 967 billionaires in the world, up from 588 in 2004, and their combined wealth grew 18% to $2.8 trillion last year. At the peak of the pinnacle, the wealthiest 20 individuals have combined assets that, combined, that exceed the combined GDP of the 65 least developed countries in 2005. As awful as these figures are to contemplate, they are made much more awful, I believe, by considering just how relatively little it would take to begin seriously redressing the imbalances between those who have and those who have not. 
The United Nations report goes on to say, and I quote, for an additional 45 billion a year, basic health, basic nutrition, basic education, reproductive health and family planning services, and water sanitation facilities could be extended to the entire world's population, unquote. How much is $45 billion? It is less than 10% of the U.S. defense budget for this year, which is now larger than the rest of the world's defense budget combined. It is the same figure that was requested by George Bush last month as a supplement to the $167 billion he's already committed, asked for, for Iraq and Afghanistan. That is, the current military budget of the U.S. of $467 billion does not include the $167 billion for Iraq or the $42 billion he just requested a couple of weeks ago. It is all represents less than one one-hundredth of one percent of the world's income in 2005. Or, if I may quote from the UN report one more time, a yearly contribution of one percent of the wealth of the 225 richest people could provide universal access to a primary education for all, and a five percent contribution would suffice to provide all of the services listed above." Unquote. Now, with statistics like these, it is easy to see why so many UN members endorse second-generation rights. 186 countries have ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Political Rights, uh, Economic, Cultural Rights, but the United States is not among them. It is the only developed nation on the list. Closer to home, it is becoming increasingly difficult to ignore the fact that 37 million Americans are living at the poverty level, with 15 million of them living at least 50 percent below that level. Almost twice that number of people, 57 million, have incomes no more than twice the poverty level. If they lose their job, they'll almost certainly fall below it. Going to work now for the new princely sum of $585 an hour, which the Congress has just raised, a full-time worker will earn $11,700 a year, barely above the poverty line for an individual, while the CEOs of the 350 largest U.S. corporations will make that sum in an hour and a half. To see how these figures compare with those of other developed countries, we may take the internationally accepted definition of poverty to be the percentage of the population whose annual income is less than half of the median for the country. By this measure, the United States ranked 24 out of 25 developed nations in 2001, and things have not improved since. Using this definition of poverty and applying it to children, and here I quote from a recent analysis of a UNICEF study, quote, the U.S. ranked dead last among 24 nations studied. 22nd out of 24 on rates of infant mortality and low birth rate, and the share of children with less than 10 books in the home." Unquote. 17 million young children in the U.S. live in families whose income is below the poverty line, even though two-thirds of them have at least one working parent. 47 million Americans have no health insurance, a figure that has gone up every year since 1998. Our prison population is now at 2.4 million, giving the U.S. the highest per capita incarceration rate in the world. And even by conservative estimates, almost twice as many Americans are homeless, many of them with jobs. And as you all know, to make the situation of the children even worse, the Congress yesterday failed to override Bush's veto of the child health care plan. Meanwhile, some supporters of Bush the 450 richest Americans have assets totaling over a trillion dollars, more than the bottom 90 percent combined. The 2007 Forbes 400 now has only billionaires on it. While many Americans are sick and are undernourished, others, listen carefully here, I didn't believe this the first several times I started reading these things myself, other Americans are investing millions of dollars in little submarines that will circle their yachts during ocean cruises. They are paying cash for $25 million homes, furnishing them with $60,000 mattresses, parking $1 million automobiles in $225,000 parking spaces in New York City, checking the time with $600,000 wristwatches, drinking $2,000 glasses of scotch in the bar at a hotel which charges $28,000 a night for a single room. Uh, 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 
that's I had some here on things on China. China is getting its share of billionaires too. We can talk about that year later. Oh, I'll give it to you quickly. This year, the number of, their number of billionaires rose to 19. Luxury cars outsell all others in China. Starter castles, or what they call McMansions here, are growing up in abundance on the outskirts of many major cities. And a recent millionaires fair in Shanghai displayed such objects as a $25 million piece of jewelry and a diamond-studded dog collar for $61,000. Uh, this is the same time that there are still 60 million people living on one, less than one dollar a day in China and six times that many living on less than two dollars a day. Now returning to the U.S. here, against the sordid statistical background we can bring into sharper focus, I believe, the fact that the more well off I am, the more I will be disinclined to see second generation rights as genuine rights. For I would surely be less free and autonomous and not as well off if I admit that they are. Rather will I exercise fully my first generation right to freedom of speech by buying advertising and providing financial contribution to those candidates for office who will see second generation rights not as rights, but as hopes or aspirations as the U.S. Senate has done when it consistently refused to ratify the U.N. Covenant on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights. Former United Nations Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick from the U.S. was more explicit and cynical referring to the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights as, quote, letters to Santa Claus, unquote. Her successor, Morris Abrams, describes such claimed rights, quote, as little more than an empty vessel into which vague hopes and inchoate expectations can be poured, unquote. What I am suggesting here from a Confucian perspective is that our preoccupation with maintaining and enhancing the formal freedom and liberty of first-generation rights that the courts and the legislatures protect has become significantly a cause of our failure to achieve greater equality and justice in a capital society and in the world. The haves and the have-mores obviously do not want to disturb the status quo and hence will spend much to ensure that they can have even more. Highly individualistic, no doubt, but not very democratic. Uh, uh, now, then we go on to argue, I want to stop this soon so we can go on to, well, let me go on a little more. A quote from the well-known theoretical economist Mankur Olson. A thriving market economy requires, among other things, institutions that provide secure individual rights. The incentives to save, to invest, to produce, and to engage in mutually advantageous trade depends particularly upon individual rights to marketable assets. Similarly, if there is no right to create legally secure corporations, the private economy cannot properly exploit productive opportunities." Unquote. Now, it might appear at first that when referring to private property, we are speaking of economic and hence second generation rights, but in actuality, we are not. Accepting the two inaugurating and thus repealing prohibition, all 27 amendments to the U.S. Constitution are either procedural or deal with civil and political rights and being able to keep, own, and be secure with one's property is stated explicitly in the Second, Third, Fourth, Fifth, and Fourteenth Amendments. Uh, as Justice Potter Stewart uh, noted some years back in a decision, quote, a fundamental interdependence exists between the personal right to liberty and personal right to property, that rights and property are basic <coughs> civil rights and have long been recognized, unquote. To see why this is so, we must understand that the concept of property rights does not refer either to physical possession, nor is it a relation holding between owners and things. Rather is it a set of relations between owners and other persons with respect to things, from which it follows that those with a great deal of money to buy things will have far more rights with reference to real property, material goods, and services than those persons living in abject poverty. To illustrate how Olson's reasoning plays out in practice and to underscore the significance of giving first generation property rights primacy over second generation, we need only look at plant closings by corporations relocating overseas in the past few decades. A number of these plants were closed even though they were making a profit. Yet not only did the government do nothing to prevent the closing, the courts always upheld the rights of the corporations to refuse to sell those factories to either the union or the city that attempted to buy them in order to keep them open. Similarly, the government does nothing to stop the corporation still operating plants or office in the U.S. from eliminating or greatly reducing their contributions to pension and or health plans, 
at times in violation of contracts assigned with the unions. But when individual civil and political rights are sacrosanct, there is little that can be done to prevent these actions. My point here is not simply to upbraid corporations and the federal government, much as they deserve it, but it's conceptual. If no one can abridge my freedom to do whatever I wish with what is legally mine, then those corporations are only claiming their legitimate civil and political rights in closing plants and letting them sit idle instead of selling them to another buyer who would keep the workers going. If we think that workers perhaps have a right to security in their jobs as long as they competently perform them, a right to expect their pensions and health plans to continue, all while the company continues making a profit or at least breaking even, then these corporation, corporate actions, on the other hand, might become morally suspect. Uh, uh, now, very quickly to conclude, I want to say that if you begin from the Confucian second generation rights, if that I see myself fundamentally as my life bound up meaningfully only with you, but I can see quickly how much I have an obligation to help you secure a job, to help you secure health care, decent clothing, housing, and so on. I have to work for the society to provide enough for each of us to be benefactors as well as beneficiaries. Then, of course, I will simultaneously have respect for civil and political rights. If my major function is to help you flourish, why would I want to shut you up? Why would I not want you to be able to speak freely about what you wanted to say? Why would I want to disturb your belief in a religion, even if I might think it a bit unusual myself, if it contributes to your contentment? Why would I not want you to have any friends other than myself? That is, if you start from this Confucian notion of relationality, you have obviously the second generation rights loom very large right in front of you, but the first generation rights are right behind them. There's no problem. But the Bill of Rights were founded in uh, 1791, 216 years ago. We haven't gotten the second generation rights yet here, and there's not a shred of historical evidence that suggests that we ever will. That is, it's a conceptual leap. It is not just practical, not just blaming politicians or anything. It is conceptual from the fact that I cannot disturb you in the exercise of your rights to freedom of assembly, speech, and worship, how do we get to the fact that I might have to help you get a job or care about whether you have house health care or anything? Much more invidiously even, and that is the history of the United States provides no, ex no, his no evidence whatsoever for suggesting we're ever going to get to the second generation rights. There are reasons why we won't ratify that. The multimillionaires won't elect politicians who would like to ratify it. Worse than that, and perhaps most invidious of all, it's only by the sacrosanct nature of the rugged individual that allows us to keep a blame the victim mentality despite all its obvious absurdity everywhere in the world. How many of you heard things during Katrina about, well, it's some of those people in Lower Ninth Ward, it's their own fault own fault that the levees broke and they couldn't, that's the only housing they had. Blaming the victim is still very strong. It's a way of letting us get away from our feeling of co-humanity in that way. This is on that basis then I'd want to suggest to you that the Confucian persuasion can easily provide a far superior moral and philosophical foundation for all human rights than the one we currently live under. Thank you.